We have two concentric coils, one having a radius much smaller than the other, and our goal in this video is to calculate the mutual inductance of the system. So how do we do this? Well, we've seen before that you can either calculate the mutual inductance of the outer coil with respect to inner, or you can calculate the mutual inductance of the inner coil with respect to the outer. Now both of them would, should give us the same answer because there's only one mutual inductance for a pair of coils. However, only one of them is really easy to calculate, the other one is a complete nightmare. <laughs> so the job really is to figure out which one should we do. So let's first try out both of them and then let's see which one we should do. All right, so let me show this to you from the side view. All right, so first let's try finding out what's the mutual inductance of the outer coil with respect to the inner coil. And to do that, we'll pass a current through the inner coil. And you can now write the flux equation. And if you're like me, you will always forget what the flux equation is. And so what I like to do is, I remember there is a beautiful analogy. Flux is very similar to momentum. Just like how objects hate changes in momentum, coils hate changes in flux. And so I know momentum is mass time velocity. And so from that I can say, ah, flux, flux of the outer coil will equal the inertia of the outer coil and that is mutual inductance of the outer coil with respect to the inner coil times, instead of velocity, we'll get current because velocity is, you know, here objects are moving, here charges are moving. How, how fast charges are moving kind of tells you how much current is. And then and always with mutual induction, this is the deal you always calculate the flux due to the current in the other coil. If you were to calculate flux due to the current in the same coil, then you would get self-inductance. Okay, so this is one way to do that. And before we try calculating, let, let's also go ahead and look at what is the other way of doing that. And the other way of doing that, let me show it over here. We can pass current through the outer coil and try to calculate the flux through the inner coil. So in doing that, flux through the inner coil, that would be just like this, it would be the mutual inductance of the inner coil with respect to the outer coil multiplied by the current in the outer coil. And now to calculate the mutual inductances, all we need to do is calculate the flux. And once you do that, we can plug in and cancel stuff out and that will give us. However, which one should we go for? We should go for the one in which the flux calculation is the easiest, right? And now would be a great time to pause the video and think about in which case do you think the flux calculation is the easiest and why? So think about how the magnetic field is, think about this condition that's given to us, and from that try to see. So pause the video and give this a shot. Okay, so how do we calculate flux in general? Well, if you have a nice and flat area A, through which let's say there is a nice and uniform magnetic field which is perpendicular to it, B, then the flux through that area would be just B times A. And so to calculate the flux, we need to first figure out how the magnetic field everywhere is over the area. So let's look at over here. Here I want to calculate the magnetic flux through the outer coil. So I need to check what the magnetic field looks like over here. But who's generating that magnetic field? That magnetic field is being generated by this coil. This is the one that's generating the current, uh, having the current, right? So let's draw the magnetic field generated by this coil and see how it spreads over this area. All right, so we've seen the magnetic field. It looks somewhat like this. Now look at how that field is spreading over that area. Is it nice and parallel and uniform? <laughs> Not at all, let me help you see this. If you only concentrate on what the field looks like everywhere on the surface, here's what it would look like. Look at that. The field is not at all uniform. It's highly concentrated over here, but there's like quickly diverging. And the field over here is in a different direction altogether. And if you were to look at the field everywhere, it's like completely different. So non-uniform field, it will be very, very difficult to calculate this flux. So this is that living nightmare I was talking about. <laughs> we'll not do this, okay? So that leaves us with only one option. Let's look at what happens over here. Here, since we are calculating the flux through this area, now we need to figure out what the magnetic field looks like over here. But who's generating the magnetic field? It's the outer coil. So let's draw the magnetic field over here due to the outer coil. It's gonna be very similar to this, but it's gonna be much larger because of the outer coil. There you go. And you might say, isn't it the same case over here? You know, here also we have non-uniform fields. True, but we are calculating the flux through this one. 
this one. So I only have to worry about the field that is acting over here. And so again, if I only look at the field over there and let me draw some arrow marks, ooh, you can see the field over there is pretty much uniform. That's because that area is very tiny. Since that area is very tiny, we can pretty much assume that the field over here is uniform. And guess what? This field is pretty much the same as the field at the center. And we already know, we've worked out before what the magnetic field due to a coil at the center is going to be. So it's very easy to calculate the flux because I can just use magnetic field times the area. And I know what the expression for the magnetic field is. And so I can plug in and figure this out. So if you are as excited as I am, why don't you pause the video and see if you can now figure out what the flux is, substitute and calculate it. Okay, let's do this. So I'm gonna continue somewhere over here. So flux equals B times A. So over here, the magnetic field, who's generating the magnetic field? The outer coil, so let's call that as B1. Magnetic field B1 times the area. Which area are we talking about? We're calculating the flux to the tiny coil, so area A2. And that should equal M21 times I1. Okay, now all we have to do is figure out what the magnetic field at the center is. And that's something we have seen before, but again, if you're like me, you may have, you may not remember. I usually don't remember formulae. And what I wanna show you is that, you know, if you remember some basic laws, you can do quick derivation. So there's not really a need to remember a lot of formula. So what's the magnetic field at the center of the coil? I don't remember, so I do a very quick derivation. I know it can be derived from Biot-Savart's law, and I know how to derive it. So let me do a very quick derivation. The way I like to do that is take a tiny current element DL, and then the magnetic field due to that tiny current element DL, I know that is mu naught by four pi, Biot-Savart's law, times I, mu naught by four pi, I DL sine theta divided by R square. Now, theta is the angle between DL and R, which is clearly 90 degrees, so this vanishes. So let me get rid of that sine theta, which is great. And R over here is R1, the radius of that big coil, so we can substitute that as well. So this is R1, R1 square, sorry, there's an R square. The current is I1 over here, so this is I1. And I quickly remember that if I do that, if I integrate over the whole thing, I get two pi R. So I know I get two pi R over here. And so the four pi, two pi cancels, one R cancels over here, so what I end up with is Sorry, there's a two over here. What I end up with is mu naught i by two r one. So let me just write that over here. So magnetic field is gonna be mu naught i one by two r one times a two. So I'm writing this over here. What is a two? A two is the area, let me bring this back. A two is the area of that tiny coil. And that is pi r square. Which r? Well, r two. r two squared. And that should equal M21 times I1. And so notice I1 cancels out and we get our expression. So immediately M21 turns out to be M21 equals what? It gives you mu naught times pi R squared, pi R2 squared divided by two R1, two R1. And there we go. That's our expression. So because our secondary coil, second coil was so tiny, we could assume that the field everywhere is the same as the field at the center and that's why this thing was given to us. And again, what's important is M21 is exactly the same as M12. So even if I had done all that hard work somehow, <laughs> I don't even know how to do that, but if you had done that, I know for sure I would have gotten the same answer. And I know it looks unbelievable, right? How can this complicated stuff give us the same answer? Well, we are not gonna prove it. <laughs> that turns out the proof is also slightly complicated, but we're gonna just accept that. That you always have only one value for mutual inductance, whether you calculate M12 or M21, it should be the same. And so whenever we have problems like this, the whole idea is to figure out which flux calculation is the easiest and then doing just that.